This presentation is on hybrid PETAMAR technology. I'd like to acknowledge that this presentation is supported by the International Atomic Energy Agency Technical Cooperation Project POL9027 entitled Enhancing the Capabilities of Positron Emission Demography Departments to provide high quality imaging and therapies to promote safety culture. The learning objectives of this talk are to go through some of the basics of MRI physics. I know we're a pet audience, but I just want to uh, quickly go through some basic pet physics too. I'll describe the um, pet, pet MR technology um, challenges around PETMR attenuation correction, uh, clinical PETMR, and opportunities of PETMR uh, in terms of the quantification that we're able to do. So let's start with uh, basic MR physics. This is an MRI scanner. Um, MRI imaging is based on um, magnetic dipoles. It does not use ionizing radiation. And it provides information on anatomy, for example, through T1 and T2 weighted imaging, and uh, provides really exquisite soft tissue contrast, much better than we, we get in CT. It can also um, image physiology and function for example, we can do diffusion imaging, perfusion imaging, oxygenation imaging, and spectroscopy. So the MRI physics, what we have um, is we have hydrogen atoms in water molecules that act as a, a dipole. And remember, uh, you know, most of our body is made up of, of water molecules in some form. And these um, dipoles are all pointing in random directions. But if we place the patient in a large magnetic field, we get a net magnetization along the direction of the magnetic field. So what happens is those dipoles will um, be aligned or counter aligned with the magnetic field but um, the net magnetization will be massively in favor of alignment with the uh, magnetic field. So what do we do with these magnetic dipoles that uh, uh, have this uh, alignment? Well, we apply radio frequency pulses to disturb the dipoles, to push them out of alignment. After the excitation with the radio frequency, um, they will fall back to equilibrium along this magnetic field. Um, and what happens is that if we have receiver coils, we can detect the signal of this translation of the um, dipoles moving from the out of alignment back to the in alignment um, uh, uh, transition. And we get contrast from different relaxation times. So we get a longitudinal relaxation, uh, which is shown uh, in green in the image on the right. So you can see uh, how that changes over time. Uh, that's T1 relaxation. And we also get transverse relaxation. So you can see the magnitude of the dipole changes again over time, but in, in a different plane. And this is um, what we call T2 relaxation. So how do we get these images? Well, we get different relaxation times in different tissues. So that means we'll get different contrasts. If uh, you know we take a measurement at different times, as you can see uh, on the image on the right, we capture the uh, realignment of these dipoles at different times. Um, in these different tissues to get as the contrasts that we see. So uh, the TR is the repetition time. It's basically the readout, uh, the readout time in this instance. So this is for T1 weighted contrast. 
And similarly in T2 weighted contrast, again, different tissues have different relaxation. So uh, if we take our measurements at different times, we'll get different contrasts in uh, the area we're imaging. The other thing to talk about is, is how we get positional information in MR imaging. Um, one way we do this uh, is how we select slices is to apply a field gradient across the same direction as the main man magnetic field. So it's a suppl supplementary field that sits on top of the main magnetic field, which means that every slice as we move up and down the patient uh, is a slightly different uh, magnetic field. So we can use this to um, select slices we want to image. We also use frequency encoding and phase encoding to, to get other positional information um, um, from the data as well. I'm not going to go that into that in, in too much detail, but if you are interested, I, I do recommend this website here. Okay, let's get back onto more familiar territory and talk about basic PET physics. Uh, we know one of these. This is a PET CT scanner. And we know that in PET, we use radial label pharmaceuticals to image physiology and function in vivo. And we know we have a whole host of different targets we can go for. Um, mostly we focus on glucose metabolism, but we can also look at targets such as cell proliferation, angiogenesis, seminal, cerebral amyloid and tau perfusion. And uh, there are also a host of neuroreceptor and neurotransmitter uh, radiopharmaceuticals uh, available to us as well. And we know the way PET works is that we have these radionuclides uh, or the pharmaceuticals that are labelled with a radionuclide um, uh, and these radionuclides are positron emitting. <clears throat> and it, what happens when these positrons are emitted from the, um, um, from the nuclide, um, they follow a random path with various interactions as they go along, uh, losing energy as they go along too, until they almost run out of energy uh, they uh, interact with an electron, uh, both electron and positron annihilate, and uh, we get these back-to-back -back photons. And if we have a ring of detectors, we can then uh, help determine where the position of the event is. We also know that um, we can do a little bit better if we have time of flight capability in PET, which um, measures the difference in the arrival time between these back-to-back -back photons. It helps us uh, get a better signal to noise and, and generally produces nicer images. And we know that if we uh, capture these lines of response from multiple angles and we perform uh, tomographic reconstruction on them, we, we get our, our PET image. And obviously some examples of glucose metabolism imaging, uh, cerebral amyloid imaging, uh, this is a nice example of a, a copper 64 ATSM a radiopharmaceutical we used a number of years ago, which was looking at hypoxia. And um, we also do amino acid uh, imaging for uh, brain tumours. I'll just show an example of that here. So this talks about PET and MR, and the question is why. Um, some might say why the question. You know, it's, it's a, the question still is why. But um, theoretically, if we look at this uh, cartoon here um, and we can see, you know, the ability of different modalities to image anatomy, physiology, metabolism and, and molecular signals, <clears throat> we see that CT is good at anatomy and physiology. MRI, um, you know, again, great at anatomy, um, physiology, but tapers out a bit metabolism and molecular signals, where we know that PET <coughs> as a nuclear um, medicine uh, imaging modality is great at um, looking at molecular signals, uh, metabolic signals, and can also image physiology. It's not so great at anatomy, as we well know. So there's great synergy here, mixing um, PET and MR in the same instrument. So this is uh, why we um, 
move towards PetMRI. This is why PetMRI was hypothesized and, and designed. What are the challenges of adding PET to MRI? We actually find that adding PET detectors to an MRI scanner affects the field homogeneity, the magnetic field homogeneity. It affects the B0, the big alignment field that the dipoles align with or counter align with. It also affects the B1, which is the radio frequency um, destabilizing field that we apply. That That's um, how we knock the dipoles out of alignment. Um, now, the effect really depends on the magnetic susceptibility of the PET detector itself. And unfortunately, um, it was found quite early on that that wasn't actually too much of a problem. So uh, a bit of a, you know, a, a small issue. We can get eddy currents in the PET detector and this can um, distort um, the applied localization field. So that slice, slice selection field. And we can control that by um, applying um, shimming blocks to the system. Um, the PET ele electronics can also affect the MR field and vice versa. And this is um, minimized by putting um, copper around the de detector block, the PET detector block. And if you've ever seen a picture of a PET detector block uh, from PETMR, you can see there's a, a lot of copper wrapping around um, the, 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 the detector systems. What's the challenge of adding MRI to PET? <clears throat> and it's this big B0 field, this big three Tesla magnet, which is 65,000 times the Earth's magnetic field. That's a big problem. And the, the problem really um, comes with the use of PET detectors, or I've called them traditional PET detectors because I think you know things have moved on since PETMR uh, was brought in. But if you remember, the traditional PET detector is made up of um, a scintillator and a photomultiplier tube. So we have our incident photon hitting the scintillator, uh, the uh, uh, radiation photon converted to light, um, the light hitting this photocathode, which produces an electron. Then we have this big part of the uh, photomultiplier tube, which amplifies the signal. Now, the challenge is that um, if we put this type of system in a magnetic field, on the image on the left, this is when we're not in a magnetic field, and you can see that the positional information is, is still quite clear. But if you put this uh, detector in a magnetic field, you lose all your positional positional information. You know, this, this photomultiply tube really doesn't like being put into a, a magnetic field. So uh, instead, what was used uh, were semiconductor um, elements to the PET detector. So we can see um, that we still have the um, we still have the um, scintillation crystal, but rather than the photomultiplier tube, what we have now is uh, an array of uh, semiconductors that will uh, read out the light. So the light still comes from the um, the uh, scintillation crystal are then these semiconductors, in this case, they were avalanche photodiodes, um, take the light signal, turn it into electrical signal and uh, apply some amplification. Um, and, and this is what we have in these APD systems. You can see an image of this on the, on the right. Um, and um, just to show what happens when you put this in a magnetic field, you can see that um, we maintain the positional information, be it um, uh, outside a magnetic field or inside the magnetic field. You can see also there's a lot of cooling involved with these semiconductors, which is uh, something we don't have a, an issue with with, um, with photomultiplier tubes, but it can be overcome. So by Replacing the photomultiplier tube by uh, this semiconductor system, um, not only have we got a system that now can work um, anywhere near a, a large magnetic field, but we've also made the detector system a lot smaller. Um, you know, those semiconductors are, are, 
a matter of millimeters uh, in size, uh, thickness, where we know the length of a photomultiplier tube can be up to 10 centimeters. So what this allows is it allows us to um, place the PET detector um, between the gradient coil, which you remember is uh, what gives us positional information, and this radio frequency coil, which disturbs the dipoles. So um, we can get, unlike in PET-CT, in PET-MR, we can have the PET and the MR fields of view in exactly the same place. We can do simultaneous PET-MR, unlike on PET-CT, where we do the CT and we do the PET, you know, we do them sequentially. So that, that's a, a great advantage. So the first PETMRs used these avalanche photodiodes, APDs, and as we've seen, the advantages is that they're compact and they're insensitive to high magnetic fields. However, the disadvantages are that they have a lower gain than the traditional photomultiplier tube, and they're also quite slow. They don't have very good timing resolution which means that we can't do time of flight PET um, using these APD systems. And, and that was the case on the uh, initial PETMR systems. They weren't capable of time of flight. Um, they're also temperature sensitive, uh, which I pointed out by showing you those cooling channels. So um, the second generation, they um, improved things. They moved from APDs to silicon photomultipliers which are effectively the same device, but they're just running in a different mode. They're running in Geiger mode rather than uh, proportional mode. So it's just counting. Um, but compared to these APDs, we get an improved gain and therefore improved SNR. We get improved timing resolution. So now actually the timing resolution is, is better than we get on a photomultiplier tube. So we're now seeing these silicon photomultiplier uh, systems now running in top of the range uh, PET CT systems as well because uh, they, they're so much better. Um, they're also still insensitive to uh, high magnetic fields, um, but um, they they still have temperature sensitivities. But uh, that's not too much of an issue really. Okay, so that's the PETMR system itself. Um, I want to talk a little bit about attenuation correction. Uh, of course, you know, I, I, I'm not, we know how we get the PET image, uh, you know, the reconstruction and such like, and we know that corrections are really important um, and, and attenuation correction is really important in PET imaging. So, um, but it's a challenge um, on pet and I want to discuss that with you now. So, as I said, PET attenuation correction is vital for accurately representing uptake because both photons in PET need to escape from the patient or the object to register an event in the PET scanner. And attenuation artifacts can be significant. So if I just show you this image here, the top image is um, without attenuation correction, the bottom image is with. And you can see, um, you know, this is filled with a uniform amount of activity, and you can see with attenuation correction, we get a, a relatively homogeneous um, signal from uh, within this phantom. But without attenuation correction, you can see the consequence of both photons needing to escape, even though they're quite high energy, you get huge reduction in signal in the center of the phantom because you're not correcting for the attenuation of these photons. So um, as we've mentioned in spec CT and we mentioned in PET CT, how do we typically attenuation correct? Well, in, in PET CT, um, we, uh, we can use this bilinear relationship between uh, CT attenuation and PET attenuation because the Hounsfield unit is related to electron density and therefore attenuation. So we can use these types of bilinear um, factors to convert between attenuation at CT and PET energies, and then apply that uh, into the uh, reconstruction to attenuation, correct? But um, in PET-MR, uh, you know, we're looking at these uh, hydrogen molecules, these hydrogen nuclei, these dipoles, 
And um, you can see when we're looking at images in MRI, we really don't see any bone. The, relax the relaxation times are incredibly short. So it's really hard to find um, bone in MR imaging. It's very hard to get bone in MR imaging. But bone is also really highly attenuating. So if we can't find it from the MR, and we need to apply a proper attenuation correction, we need to think of, of other solutions. The initial solution for PET attenuation correction came from uh, whole body imaging using a two-point Dixon technique. So readouts are taken at different echo times to get um, images of when water and fat images are both in and out of phase. And then we can do maths to get some fat and water images, which we can then translate into air, water and fat attenuation values. So you can see you're only getting three attenuation values here. There's not a scale. And of course, uh, we're, not, we're not getting born in this uh, approach. So the Dixon method does not consider bone at all, which may be okay for um, uh, oncology imaging, mostly at least. But if we're working in the brain, then we do get a problem because we have the brain surrounded by, um, by the skull, uh, which of course is completely bone material. So how do we capture a bone signal? Um, this... We use these methods called uh, UTE, ultra low echo time or zero echo time, um, to really capture um, these uh, these relaxation times that are very, very short. So with UTE, you take two echoes, which is uh, faint bone and no bone, um, and you do some maths and set some fixed attenuation correction values. For the uh, ZTE method, you again have a very faint bone signal with the uh, echo that you echoes that you uh, capture, but this time you try to scale um, the uh, signal to um, um, attenuation correction values. Just want to show you, um, you know, the challenges we get here in brain imaging. So uh, in this panel on the right here, this is from work we did uh, quite some years ago now when we first got the petamol. Um, so this is our attenuation correction, um, CT, which is effectively a smooth version of this um, um, CT, diagnostic CT. Um, so we can see uh, the detail we're getting here in the, the um, around the temple bone area. If we move to the Dixon, you see we've got no bone whatsoever, which is really completely um, inadequate. And for the UTE, or certainly the first, first version of the UTE, although it's been improved now, um, it gets a little bit better. You start to recover some of this bone, but nowhere near as much as it should be. You're starting to get some of the um, sinuses, but again, at the wrong size. So um, attenuation correction in the brain is a, is a real challenge. Uh, it's improved since this work we did back in 2012, 2013, um, but it's still a challenge. So what are the alternatives to us other than the Dixon and um, these UTZT techniques? Um, there's Atlas-based approaches um, where we use databases of MR and CT pairs to derive a, a pseudo-CT. Um, in oncology imaging as well, they'll try and estimate where the bone is and put a bone attenuation where they think our bones are as well. So. Um, that, that, that's a, a, a move forward since uh, uh, the early days of Petamar. There's reconstruction approaches, so uh, we can use the maximum likelihood of activity and attenuation uh, techniques to simultaneously solve um, the activity distribution and attenuation. And having time of flight PET on these newer systems that we have in Petamar now can bring benefits here. And of course, artificial intelligence is the um, I'm making headway in this front as well. And uh, I just want to point you to, um, um, if you're interested in pet MR attenuation to uh, correction, to point you to this paper by uh, Cyprian Katana 
um, from 2020. Uh, it, it's a really thorough exploration of um, the challenges and solutions for um, PETAMAR attenuation correction. So I'm a medical physicist, so I've got to talk about phantoms for QC. And the answer is it's really hard to scan um, traditional nuclear medicine phantoms on PETAMAR because um, PETAMAR, the attenuation correction values that you get depend on tissue characteristics, which of course we don't have when we're imaging a phantom. Um, what we need to do instead is uh, CT the object and then register that uh, to the PET data we acquire on our PETMR so that we can attenuation correct. There are no real dual PET and MR phantoms available as far as I'm aware at the moment, but uh, you know the people are working on these things um, and they they look a little bit scary, but uh, you know people are making progress. Of course, phantoms are not just for QC; they're for optimization too. So, um, not having uh, phantoms to optimize on or to do quality control on is, is a bit of a challenge uh, for us in Petamar. Let's now um, show you some clinical images, um, some clinical PetMRI. So in neurology, uh, we use our PetMRI scanner quite a bit in neurology and it's really nice for looking at Alzheimer's disease and other degenerative disorders because you can see the reduction in signal, but you can also relate in any reduction in PET signal to um, atrophy um, by overlying on the, on the MR. Um, yeah, so another example here, but so, you know, having the PET and MR together is really great for seeing if it's a real loss in metabolism in this instance, or is it a loss of anatomy rather than a loss of um, metabolism. In oncology, uh, we can use the benefits of, you know, the great soft tissue contrast of MR. This was a, a case of uh, rectal cancer using FDG and, um, you know, we get wonderful uh, um, image quality here. Uh, another example of PETMR of cervical cancer, and this time we've used two radio pharmaceuticals to try and um, uh, characterize the disease in this patient. And the other real big uh, use of PETMR for us in oncology is in, is in prostate cancer, where it can be really helpful to uh, you know, characterize the prostate tissue when you're looking at where um, your PET uptake might be localizing. And we've done a little bit on cardiology, trying to mix up perfusion and viability using uh, MR and FDG um, PET. And neuro-oncology too, there's advantages here because of course, uh, you know, uh, neuro-oncology, if you're using PET to try and target um, these uh, tumors, uh, CT really doesn't give you sufficient anatomical information. But equally, you know, we do PET MR because sometimes if a, uh, a patient has had radiotherapy or surgery, um, the MR can be really difficult to interpret. Uh, you know what what you're looking at is it uh, is it disease or is it some kind of flare from the intervention? Uh, so uh, we're using PETMR quite a bit in neuro oncology too. Uh, we've also used it in in, in radiotherapy planning for um, using gallium sixty eight dototate um, to try and isolate target volumes uh, in meningioma. So we're going to finish this presentation by talking about some of the opportunities we can get with quantification on PETMR. So, you know, another synergy of PETMR in that is that MR can help us deal with some of the limitations of PET. We know that PET has poor spatial resolution. We know that PET has long scan times, which are prone to patient motion. And we know that if we're doing dynamic imaging, um, you know, our data can be noisy, uh, which gives us some challenges in quantification too. So let's look at these. Um, so how can PETMR improve um, PET spatial resolution? Well, MRI can provide anatomical and motion information, which we can incorporate into reconstructions. 
So uh, this is a work from one of our PhD students from a number of years ago now, where they were using the um, MR information as a prior to try and help the reconstruction put the PET data in the right place. And you can see um, uh, the, the image on the right, we can see we're, we're getting um, really quite nice looking images using the generative approach. And uh, we went further, or he went further, Stefano, uh, in trying to put um, motion and anatomical information as a prior into the uh, reconstruction. And again, if we look at the image on the right here, it's, uh, it's, it's really nice. Um, image quality we're getting here by uh, applying these anatomical and motion priors. So that's one way we can help with improving pet spatial resolution. Um, another one is um, trying to deal with the partial volume effect and the spill out of signals, a signal from tissues, knowing that this pet spatial resolution is four to five millimeters. So using MRI and knowledge of the spatial resolution or the PSF of the uh, PET system, we can put signal into right places. And uh, this is some work we did um, looking at glucose metabolism imaging and cerebral amyloid imaging. So uh, you can see that the um, PET image uh, is quite blurred, but we know where the signals come from. So we can put it back in uh, using this uh, MR information and spatial resolution information, we can put it back into the correct place. I'm not sure I'd want to read that image. I think uh, it becomes very difficult to read there. Um, but for region of interest analysis, it's it's uh, it's a positive step. And for you know cerebral amyloid imaging, you know we get images like this one on the right, where um, if we um, again um, apply this partial volume correction technique, we can we can quite clearly see where the signal is and it becomes a lot easier to determine whether the signal is actually in the gray or the white matter of the brain, which of course is really important when we're interpreting these images. Uh, a quick slide for the physicists here. This is how we apply this uh, form of partial volume correction I showed in the last slide. So we have um, our MR or CT image, MR, if it's from PETMR, we create uh, a mask in some regions. We look at our PET data. We look at the average uh, uh, uptake in these uh, in this in these regions that we get from the mask or these masked regions. Um, we convolve with the uh, spatial resolution information of the system, and uh, we get a ratio of correcting factors. Uh, which we can then put in to either correct the image or go through another iteration. Uh, we usually go through this through several uh, iterations before we get the final image that you saw on the last slide. Um, okay. We can also um, use PETMR to help us with kinetic modeling, and in particular with us um, deriving image-derived input functions. So um, we know that kinetic modeling of PET traces typically requires invasive arterial blood sampling. And, um, you know, we'd like to get this information from our calibrated scanners to get, um, you know, image derived input functions. But we have challenges with partial volume losses, particularly in brain imaging, if we wanted to use the carotid artery as a, an input function for our kinetic modeling. Um, you know, the, uh, the size of those vessels is really quite small compared to the spatial resolution of the system. But um, what we did uh, a few years back now is we used um, partial volume correction to help um, get image-derived input functions from the carotid arteries, which we then were able to use um, for kinetic modeling in the brain. Another thing uh, we've been looking at is joint kinetics. If you're into kinetic modeling, you know, there are, is some synergy between what you get from DCE, dynamic contrast enhanced MRI, and PET. So uh, one of our researchers in our team looked at this and, and was able to do some joint kinetics using um, uh, the information from both PET 
and MR um, uh, modalities. As we mentioned earlier, one of the challenges we get in uh, PET imaging, particularly if we're doing long scans, and we can do long scans if we're doing dynamic brain imaging to do some kinetic modeling, and we can get problems with motion uh, in these long scans. So uh, this was a method that the team came up with to try and uh, deal with this motion. And uh, it has several phases. So in the first phase, uh, what it does uh, in the early stages is it acquires fast MR images interleaved with clinical MR to uh, estimate motion at the beginning of the scan. We then uh, go into another phase where we will look at the list mode PET data and use principal component analysis to detect motion in areas where there's sufficient contrast during the dynamic PET. And where we get to the later PET phases, the later PET frames, where actually there's quite a bit of information in the uh, PET uh, images, we can uh, do PET-based motion estimation to correct in these uh, frames. And you know, by pulling us all together, we can correct motion by aligning PET frames using both MR-based and PET-based transformations. We know motion, uh, uh, respiratory motion is a challenge too. And we know that ideally, if we can uh, deal with this, we can improve lesion detection and localization, reduce um, uh, artifact and improve quantification. And this is again what uh, one, one of our PhD students did, where uh, he created a model of motion and was able to apply this through uh, a PET scan to um, correct for, for motion. So we can see here the uh, uncorrected and the corrected PET data. So you can see uh, you know, significant improvements there. And what we can also do on PETMR is um, do multi-parametric imaging. So we scan uh, a lot of epileptic patients who are candidates for, for surgery. Um, so we can use the PET um, to look at areas of hypometabolism. We can use functional MRI to um, look at uh, cognitive areas or looking at um, speech centers or um, other centers that might be affected um, by the surgical or the potential surgical area. And simultaneously as well, we can also do tractography to understand the nerve, um, where the nerves are, so the surgeon has a, a good idea how to attack the surgery when, when they go in. Um, uh, another uh, area of parametric imaging that can be done is... Um, Looking at using arterial spin labeling, ASL, as a surrogate of um, PET, um, regional cerebral blood flow imaging or blood glucose. So this was something we were looking at um, when we were doing our amyloid PET MR imaging. So we know that uh, obviously these amyloid scans are good at looking at amyloid status. Um, and, and that helps determine if you're on the early pathway towards uh, Alzheimer's or, or not. Um, but having information about the metabolism or the blood flow within the brain at the same time can also be helpful. So uh, we did a small study where we uh, looked at doing this arterial spin labeling to give us a measure of uh, blood flow in, in the brain too. And this was done simultaneously to the amyloid imaging and, and um normal um, anatomical imaging to uh, better understand the patient's condition. Uh, the final multi-parametric imaging um, uh, example here is the prostate again, where we can look at PET signal, we can look at anatomy on the left-hand side, and we can look at um, diffusion, an image on the top right here, um, and try and um, find mutual information from that. And, and people have done this already, and it's, it's, it's quite nice in that what you can do is you can um, pixelate the image or put small regions in the image and look at high areas of SUV 
and high areas of diffusion. So you have this kind of quadrant approach is the SUV high and the ADC low uh, and the other areas. And then you can look at this tumour and characterise the tumour in terms of its uh, SUV and diffusion characteristics, which I think is quite nice. I'd like to acknowledge the various contributors to this presentation, um, which has involved lots of PhD students and postdocs and researchers over the years. So I just want to acknowledge their uh, contribution here. This uh, concludes this presentation. Thank you for listening.